Hello and uh, welcome to my talk as part of this member-initiated symposium on the fundamentals and history of zero echo time or ZTE MRI. Uh, my name is Peter Larson. I'm a professor at the University of California, San Francisco. I was very much looking forward to being with you all in London uh, today, but this little thing you may have heard of called uh, COVID kind of got in the way, unfortunately, and as it's been doing for a lot of us. All right, I'll start off by declaring uh, conflicts of interest, research support from GE Healthcare uh, Advisory Board and ownership in Imagine Logistics. All right, so let's jump right into the zero echo time or the ZTE pulse sequence. We're really gonna start with the basic building block of the pulse sequence here. And that's shown at the top right. Um, this is from the, uh, actually the first paper from 1984 on uh, ZTE pulse sequences. And really the key innovation of the ZTE sequences is that the gradients are turned on before the RF excitation pulse. And when this happens, the echo, which is a gradient echo, occurs during the RF pulse and then uh, continue to travel in case space immediately during and after the uh, RF pulse is played. And what is then done is as fast as possible, we're switching from transmit to receive, there's some associated dead time, uh, but then we're sampling it as soon as possible after that to acquire our data. Uh, and this is where the term zero echo time comes from, is that the echo is during the RF pulse. Um, there is one challenge that we'll get to, of course, that is not, we're not sampling the center of case space and we'll have to address that. So one of the main advantages of the ZTE pulse sequence is the silent scanning capabilities. And how do we achieve that? So now here I've taken that single block of the ZTE pulse sequence, expanded it to multiple TRs. And the key here is really that by having the gradient on before the RF pulse, um, we actually can just slightly increment uh, the gradient amplitudes between TRs, slowly changing the projection angle that we're acquiring in case space. And since gradient switching causes all the acoustic noise in MRI, this minimal switching results in effectively silent scanning. Okay, but back to this, um, some of the fundamentals of how we're gonna fill up case space in ZTE. So uh, as now you may have gathered, uh, ZTE is a fundamentally center out case based sampling sequence, uh, typically done with 3D radial. Um, these are the examples I've shown so far, um, but with really this main limitation that we're missing the center of case space due to this dead time between the RF pulse and when we can turn on our data acquisition. And this amount of dead time is determined by our RF pulse duration, uh, how fast our scanner can switch between transmit and receive, uh, associated filtering, ring up times as well. Um, and one of the first approaches to try to correct this was what are called algebraic ZTE methods. Uh, this is used as uh, some basically signal model to fill in the center of case space. Um, but really, this is not used so much because it's typically ill conditioned with the dead times and sampling that we're using on typical human imaging systems. So there's a couple other strategies that are quite popular and quite effective at filling the center of case space. Um, one of them is what's called PETRA. Uh, this is what's called a single point imaging technique, where we fill this outer region of case space with the, again, what we've seen so far. And to fill the middle, we go point by point, each TR here with the, these blue areas, indicating that we're sampling just a single point of that central case space region per TR. Now, as you can imagine, a single point is relatively slow, but it does provide this very short TE weighting on the case space center data, which is advantageous for, for short T2 star imaging. Another approach that's a little more quick uh, is to what's called typically called WASPI, uh, and that's to acquire a smaller number of projections with scaled down gradients. So we're sampling a much smaller area of case space indicated by the red sphere here um, with the same sequence um, and then these uh, these uh, lower resolution data basically these 
smaller distance to k space can be set in to fill in the middle of the 3D k space there. With the disadvantage that now in the center of k space, we may be going out uh, taking a relatively long time, so we may have a relatively long waiting in k space um, that can lead to more significant uh, off resonance or T2 star blurring artifacts. Another um, exciting approach is actually to combine the best of these two approaches, the Petra or single point imaging and the WASPy or scaled down gradient approach, and actually into this technique called HIFI, where we can engineer the trade-offs between scan time and also this case space time weighting or the modulation transfer function that can lead to T2 star and off resonance uh, blurring. So this is a very uh, a clever approach here to combine both of those where you can see along the bottom where the Petra technique again gives consistent high what would effectively be high signal for the short times. Uh, the radial acquisition in WASPy can lead to um, signal decay over the center of K-space, whereas HIFI can kind of do a mixture of both of these. All right, so after filling in K-space, let's go back and look at the RF excitation pulse. As some of you, I'm sure, have been noticing, um, the gradient is turned on the RF pulse, so there is some potential slice selection effect but in a very strange way in that the slice is actually changing every TR, so it's rotating. So here's an example, um, here's our pulses. This is a sync uh, pro, uh, flip angle profile for a, a hard or block shaped RF pulse where every TR, we're gonna put a sync shape weighting on the image, but then as the gradients change, this weighting actually rotates, so this effective slice rotates as well. And so this leads to some very blur, uh, bizarre blurring artifacts we'll show on the next slide. No consistent slice selection, making ZT inherently 3D. Um, and the typical uh, solution has been to use the shortest possible hard or block shaped pulses. These provide the highest flip angle, the highest bandwidth uh, in order to minimize uh, this effect and, and putting limits on the pulse to, uh, flip angle and also the gradient amplitudes uh, can mitigate uh, this potential artifact. So, you know, if we are able to use, let's look at the top right example with different pulse durations. If we're able to use a very short pulse, we see no effect, no shading. As we go to, a, for this example, a longer pulse, we see a shading effect of the uh, this reduced pulse uh, excitation bandwidth and it becomes even more severe with longer pulses or shown at the bottom here is an example of increasing the gradient strength <coughs> in which case we see at the edges particularly the edges of the image where now these hard pulses are starting to actually um, not always excite the spins um, we get to some weird fuzzy blurring not our typical mr blurring artifacts but some weird kind of fuzzy blurring artifacts towards the edges of the field of view It is possible uh, to correct for this um, by uh, actually incorporating the RXF excitation profile into the uh, data for each projection that is acquired um, under, with, with the uh, knowledge this has to be now not a, just a Fourier transform, it has to be a full matrix inversion with this profile pi differently to each uh, projection data. Uh, this works up to a point until these RF excitation nulls overlap with the field of view, and then we can see effects like noise amplification and residual uh, artifact uh, in these two examples. And even more sophisticated, I'll just talk briefly about this, but something if you're interested to look more into, I highly recommend it, as to use shaped pulses. So on the right here, these so-called optimized pulses are, I believe, a hyperbolic secant shape. Um, that take the longer pulse duration and actually just shape the profile of it a little bit more. Uh, really clever recent work showed that oh, actually if you do a couple of frequency swept pulses, you can control the coherence encodings um, during the RF pulse, so actually kind of shifting the echo time a little bit. And if you do this a couple of times with different pulse encodings, this really improves the conditioning of the reconstruction for the optimized uh, type pulses and allows for this for example, a nicely T1 weighted image with the PEZTE here.
Okay, another unique characteristic of the ZTE sequence is how it does spoiling. And you notice there's not your typical uh, spoiling gradient for like a gradient uh, crusher type gradient, right? Um, and if we did this, this would really uh, make the sequence loud. It would, and we actually have a really high duty cycle, high SNR efficiency with uh, ZTE sequences. This is nice to maintain. And I don't know if it was an accident or on purpose, but it turns out that, well, actually, if you do the sequential ordering of the radio projections, um, there's this accumulated spoiling, uh, gradient spoiling effect arising from all the previous TRs. Um, so uh, here's here's an example from, from an analysis of UTE work, um, but the same principle applies to ZTE, where if we naturally do the sequential or smoothly varying ordering of the projection angle, we get this accumulated spoiling moment that um, enables no coherences to be refocused. And if we do have to be careful, there are ways to uh, undo this. Uh, this golden angle, not really practical for, for ZTE, but there are cases where you could um, certainly um, lead to uh, refocusing and destroy this nice um, spoiling effect that ZTE relies on. Um, okay, so for both this lack of the spoiler gradient and maintaining our silence scanning, um, we're gonna want to do some smoothly ordered or smoothly varying uh, 3D trajectory. Uh, the top here I've illustrated the spiral and a sphere type um, 3D radial trajectory, the most common. Um, but there are a couple other very useful options that are really uh, actually important for doing things like retrospective binning for time resolved or motion resolved or these type of XD uh, reconstructions. A few examples here, the Philotaxis trajectory, the Aztec, and at this meeting you can go check out the tennis ball. Um, trajectory as well. Another major area of opportunity with ZTE to access a broader range of contrast is to use magnetization preparation modules. Um, and this opens up actually a much broader range of contrast with ZTE sequences. So these can be with T1 um, inversion recovery type sequences, so these MP Rage. Uh, class of sequences. Um, you can do that with a, a T2 prep module. So here I've highlighted, if you do a 90, 180, 90 with some time gap in the middle, you create some T2 weighting and then can apply the Rufus or the ZTE readout. Or if we uh, add diffusion weighting gradients in between the 90 and 180 pulses, this becomes goes from a T2 prep module into a diffusion weighted uh, prep module. Uh, or you can see in the example at the bottom, you can replace that with a magnetization transfer preparation module as well. So you know, here we're doing one some type of preparation followed by uh, a segment or a large number of uh, the um, ZTE readouts and then repeating that depending on how quickly the contrast uh, goes away or needs to be resampled. And so uh, just showing some impressive uh, results in the, in the brain of different types of contrast, T1, uh, T2, T2 flare, MT, and also an example of, of diffusion here in the body with uh, magnetization prepared CTE. Um, just briefly wanted to show this. I don't think I have time to go into the detail, but you can also manipulate the TE um, by actually increase, using the hyphae technique, increasing that dead time and, and actually decreasing the gradient and readout bandwidth um, to get actually multi-echo time images. And there's a nice subtraction image showing some myelination. Um, I do want to make sure to touch on a couple, uh, another ZTE-like sequence, which is the looping star technique. Uh, again, I don't have time to go into the detail here. I want to make you aware of this. Uh, it has a very a specific case-based sampling pattern that I haven't talked about yet, where you have to do these looping stars that uh, create these actually uh, coherence pathways that will be refocused. So the blue line at the at part C here represents 
um, the excitation from the first RF pulse getting dephased and then rephased uh, several times over the course of this plot here. So you can actually sample, and this is an example with four different echo times, getting T2 star contrast for uh, QSM, bold, just T2 star. And the last piece of content I really wanted to have here is just show this comparison between ZTE and UTE, ultra short TE pulse sequences, as they often come up together. Um, UTE has a couple of advantages that are related to some of the concepts that I've discussed here. It can do slab or slice selection and is pretty open-ended in terms of the range of flip angles that are provided or available. Um, but uh, ZTE has the advantages of it. It really is the shortest possible TE that I'm aware of that you're going to get. It's, it's going to get you the best short T2 star signal. Uh, it's very insensitive to gradient fidelity, so you don't have to worry so about eddy currents, uh, really gradient delays too much, those types of effects. And of course, it is quiet, it is silent. Um, and, and this is a, uh, not true for most UTE sequences. Okay, so ZTE, now you know. We've got to do ZTE by applying our gradients before our RF pulse. Uh, it's the silent scanning is enabled by slowly varying gradients between TRs. It's an inherently 3D technique where we need to fill the center of case-based data somehow. And I've hopefully given you a flavor of the couple techniques to do that. Okay, we need to be careful with the RF excitation as it can introduce slice selection blurring artifacts. Um, we can either um, set design parameters or use some advanced tricks to, to solve that. You have spoiling through smoothly varying case bait readout direction. And then you have these other dimensions of contrast opened up by using magnetization preparation, the TE manipulation, and the looping star approach. So thanks for listening. Now go out there and impress your friends with your silent MRI scanning knowledge. Thank you.